The reason I'm here, however, is to predict the future, and it is very likely that you'll want to know what gives me the right to predict the future, right? I mean, what are my qualifications? So I'll tell you what my qualifications to predict the future are. My chief qualification took place in 1952 when I found myself in Chicago. I found myself in Chicago because I had to address the American Chemical Society, which was a thankless task. I discussed a, some experiments of mine and got very few laughs. So, so I decided to visit the offices of a small science fiction magazine called Universe Science Fiction. At any rate, I had to think of something fast because I was ashamed to say that I didn't have the slightest idea of what to write. And thinking quickly, I wrote a story called Everest because there, Everest was much in the news then. And I thought that since seven expeditions had failed, that I might as well write a little story about why expeditions failed. And I explained it by saying that the abominable snowmen were Martians. And they kept, Amer they kept human travelers off the top. She read the story, bought it on the spot for $30. I spent half of it in a dinner for her and me. In those days, you could buy a very good dinner for two for $15 and got nowhere. Went home, a Saturn wiser man, and forgot about it until the next May 30th, 1953, when somebody to whom I hadn't done a darn thing named Edmund Hillary and his Sherpa sidekick, Tenzing Norgay, climbed Mount Everest and at 11.30 a.m. stood at the very tippy tip top, they said. And <laughs> Well, who is there to check up, you know? <laughs> and that instantly placed universe science fiction in a very, very strange ethical dilemma. If they published the story, they would make me look like a fool. And if they didn't publish story, the story, they would lose $30. <laughs> and it took them a second and a quarter to decide to publish. And they did. They published in the December 1953 issue so that there is my record as a predictor of the future. I am the only man living who ever predicted that Mount Everest would never be climbed five months after. <laughs> I will now talk about the future. And the first thing we have to remember that you're only safe if you predict the obvious. The fact that the abominable snowmen were Martians were not, uh, was not obvious. Probable, perhaps, but not obvious. So to predict something that's obvious, let's predict that the population of the Earth will go up. After all, it's been going up ever since the beginning of human history, as far as we know. In fact, the only century that we know of in which the human population dropped all over the world was in the 14th century as a result of the depredations of the Black Death, during which one third of the entire human race was killed off in the space of maybe 25 years. And it took the human species a full century to make up that loss. And you might wonder, because these days we could do that in maybe 20 years. And see why? See what I mean? <laughs> And you may wonder why it took them that long in the old days and think that perhaps they didn't know the secret. Well, I have every reason to believe they knew the secret and worked away at it as assiduously as honest people do today. What happened was that although many children were born, many children died. The death rate was high in those days and the rate of increase was low. Since then, we have managed to improve matters. And that reminds me of how difficult it is to know a dangerous scientific discovery when you hear one. I mean, everybody is against all kinds of technological advances that seem dangerous. Large automobiles, gas-guzzling monsters, nuclear fission plants, uh, 
these aluminum beer cans, all sorts of things people scorn, scorn. Is there anything they like? Yes, cancer research they like. Research into all kinds of diseases, that's good. They say, why are we busy going off into space? Why don't we spend our time trying to cure cancer? Uh, that's because most people don't expect to go into space, but most people expect to run the risk of cancer. But if you stop and ask yourself, what is the most dangerous discovery that was ever made? The answer was the germ theory of disease, which came out in the 1860s. Because as the result of actually learning what caused infectious disease, we gradually learned how to take measures that minimized infectious disease, helped cure it if it was caught, and eventually, through the conquest of infectious disease, we doubled the lifespan of the human being from an average of perhaps 35 to an average in the more, quote, advanced, unquote, nations of perhaps 70. So that every one of us lives twice as long as he would have lived if he had lived, say, 120 years ago, which is nice. Most people don't object to that. <laughs> but it does leave us with a population explosion because, as a matter of fact, what governs the Earth's population is the birth rate and the death rate. If the birth rate is higher than the death rate, the population goes up. Or, if you want to look at it another way, if the death rate is lower than the birth rate, the population goes up. And vice versa, if the birth rate is lower than the de <laughs> death rate, or the death rate is higher than the birth rate, have I got it all straight? Doesn't matter, it's a college audience. I say, <laughs> I say what I please and you sort it out because you know what I mean. <laughs> now, right now the birth rate is going, the, right now the population is going up fast, faster and faster and at the present moment, I think it stands at something like 1.6% per year. About five years ago, it was almost 2% per year. It's been going down slightly because they say the birth rate in China has fallen. We have the Chinese word for that. <laughs> I don't know how they've managed it. I think by moral suasion. They send around the cadres from house to house and they spend time talking to the young wives and they spend so much time talking she doesn't have time to raise the birth rate. <laughs> but even so, at 1.6%, that's 72 million people each year, additional. And 72 million is about the population of Bangladesh almost, so that it's as though we've got a new Bangladesh on Earth every year. And we haven't yet arranged to take care of the original Bangladesh. Question is, what are we going to do about it? And we've got to go back to that birth rate, death rate business. There are only two ways of handling an expanding population if you think that it's dangerous and if you want to establish population stability or even reduce the population to a reasonable level. There are only two ways to do it. You can either raise the death rate until it's higher than the birth rate, or you can lower the birth rate until it's lower than the death rate. Fortunately, those are the only two ways. If there were 50 ways, every way would have its adherence and it'd be a very big mess. As it is, we just count how many people favor raising the death rate how many people favor lowering the birth rate? Of course, there might be some people who say, I don't want to do anything, just let things go. And the beauty of it is that that will raise the death rate, which is the advantage of raising the death rate. You don't have to do anything. No hard decisions, no political difficulties, no sacrifices. Just go on, do exactly what you've been doing. Population will go up. The death rate will also go up eventually and bring the population down. Only trouble is that's what we call catastrophe because the methods for raising the death rate are also limited. You can do it by violence such as war or terrorism or civil strife, doesn't matter. Kill off people in anger or by disease or by famine. There's your choice. All through history all through the history of life, whenever a species has increased its numbers to the point where it outstripped its food supply, it has always redressed its numbers 
by an increase in death rate. It's nature's way. If you like things that are natural, you'll be crazy about famine. <laughs> However, human beings are the only species that ever existed on Earth who are capable of foreseeing the future, if perhaps not in detail, then in broad brush strokes. Show a human being a situation in which the population is going up and the food supply is going down, and by dint of considerable hard thought, it will eventually occur to him that this will end in famine. And it may be that he doesn't like famine because he suspects that it may not strike other people only. In which case, he may decide to do something about it, which is to increase the food supply or decrease the population. Now, of course, everyone says right away, well, let's increase the food supply for goodness sakes. It can be done. We can support four billion people. What's needed is not more food. We have plenty of food. Just distribute it more decently. Fix it so that everyone gets his fair share. Fix it so that governments are sane and don't do things that are stupid. Fix it that people are honest and unselfish and share with each other. Fix it that the economic system is honest and trade is efficient and everybody works decently and if pigs had wings, they would fly. <laughs> but even if that happened, in about 40 years, there'll be 8 billion people on Earth. And if you've managed to keep up with that, in 40 years more, there'll be 16 billion people on Earth. And in a little while, 250 years to be exact, the total number of population on Earth will be such that the average density will be 100,000 per square mile. Now, 100,000 per square mile is something that's easily described for those of you who have ever been in Manhattan at lunch hour. <laughs> that's it. I'm there every lunch hour. I know exactly what it looks like. People all over the streets, wall to wall, with lots more hidden in the skyscrapers. And in 250, beg your pardon, is it 250 years? No, it's 450, I wouldn't lie to you. In 450 years at the present rate, the population density the world over will be 100,000 per square inch. Not only in nice places like the Berkshires, <laughs> but in Greenland, Antarctica, the Himalayan mountains, the Sahara Desert, and if you'll throw planks across the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean on them too, and you have the feeling that you're going to have one world-girdling skyscraper, partial, partially apartment houses, partially factories, partially, partially all kinds of things, schools, colleges, and the entire ocean taken out of its bed and placed on the roof of the globe-girdling and growing, and growing algae or something like that, because all those people will have to be fed and the only way they can be fed is to allow no waste whatever. Item one, no competition. So as you can't feed other creatures too, as well as human beings, that means not only no more Sumatran tigers, no more Burmese rhinoceroses, no more California condor, it means no more pussycats, no more puppy dogs, no more goldfishes. <laughs> No more caterpillars, no more nothing except human beings. And of course, they can't live on something which has waste. Can't waste a thing. We've got to grow something which is 100% edible, like one-celled creatures. And for goodness sakes, you have this ocean on the apartment house roof boiling away in the sun, just frothing over with algae. And every once in a while you have thick conduits leading down the ocean water from which you take out the algae and all the other uh, plankton or whatever the heck it is. And you pound it and you separate it and you flavor it and you cook it. And finally you have your pseudo steak and your mock veal and your healthful sub vegetables and so on. And then you send the water that's left over up there, but you have to grow some more algae. In addition to the algae that exists, you're going to have to fertilize them, give them nutrients. Where can you get your nutrients from, for God's sakes? 
only from chopped up corpses and human wastes. So you've got other conduits leading upward. This is not exactly such a good world, but maybe if we manage to make it, we'll be used to it. And we'll say, this is great, except that in 40 years more, the population density of the earth will be 200,000 per square mile. Obviously, in a relatively short time, like for instance, 3,000 years, the total weight of flesh and blood will be equal to the total weight of the earth. And in 9,000 years, it'll be equal in total weight of the known universe. So, let's face it. <laughs> Sooner or later, we'll have to stop. We can't not do anything. Either the, either the death rate will go up or the birth rate will go down. And I personally prefer that the birth rate go down. Question is, how is it going to happen? Because the disadvantage of using the birth rate going down as a method of controlling population is that it's never been tried, really. And we don't know if it'll work. So certainly we're going to have to use some method that's never been used. And I've got a method, believe it or not. I have noticed that throughout history, whenever the birth rate has been high, the social status of women has been low. And this makes sense. This is not a pure coincidence. This is reasonable. Because if a woman has a lot of babies, and if each one takes nine months, and so far this is one thing the Industrial Revolution has <laughs> not been able to change, nor does it help to get more men on the job. And besides, I don't know if any of you people have noticed it, but after the baby is born, it hangs around the mother an awful lot for a while. <laughs> and before the baby stops hanging around the mother, there's another one on the way, and then another one, and then another one. And the woman has all she can do to bear the babies, and suckle the babies, and take care of the babies, and clean the house, and cook, and pull the plow when the horse isn't feeling good, and things like that. <laughs> And under circumstances like that, you're going to waste time educating a woman? For what? You're going to waste time expecting her to do things that are human, like helping to run the world? Of course not. Poor thing has enough work to do. So she just stays there, ignorant and without shoes, and working away until she dies, but then she's easy to replace. On the other hand, and those periods in world history not too long, and those areas, not too extended, in which women have had reasonable treatment, treated as kind of subhuman men, uh, <laughs> the birth rate has dropped automatically. In fact, people right away start worrying about race suicide as soon as the birth rate drops. Never worry about race suicide as the population goes up. This is a peculiarity of the human species. And you say, why on earth should the birth rate drop since the highest, since absolutely the highest calling any woman can possibly aspire to is that of being a wife and mother? What else can she possibly want to do? You hear all over the place about how great it is, motherhood, you know? And I mistrust that because I always figure that anything that has to be pushed that hard can't be that good. I figure nobody goes around saying, eat. <laughs> you know, it'll keep your strength up. <laughs> nobody goes around with billboards saying, don't be a fool, breathe. <clears throat> <laughs> so that when you're forever being told how great it is to have lots of children, I figure, Ah, eh, someone's getting something out of it. Besides, I figure we're having children are that great, men have figured out a way to do it. <laughs> Mind you, I'm not against children. I have two of my own. Uh, of course, when I say I had two of my own, they didn't do much. No, no man ever does. But uh, still, uh, I wouldn't want people not to have any children because if children stop altogether, then the human race comes to an end in less than a century, no matter how many of us there are. But to say you don't want no children doesn't mean you want all women to be baby machines. There's such a thing as moderation. One or two children is plenty. 
Can a woman be satisfied with one or two children? Sure she can, why not? It isn't so great having a lot of children. If you have nothing else to do, certainly. And the population will automatically drop. And in addition, the brain power of the human species will automatically be doubled as far as honest use of it was concerned without adding a single person to the actual population. Might be more than doubled. We've never given women a chance. They may be smarter than us. Of course, some men are afraid of this. They feel that they'll be sharing some of their precious privileges. Don't look at it that way. You're sharing some of your responsibilities. My own feeling is it's about time that women did half the work in the world. And, <laughs> and took half the risks and half the blame and all the rest of it. In fact, uh, who knows? The last act of male chauvinism on earth may be that of forcing women to take their share, much against their will. Too darn many women are so happy at having hats taken off in their presence and being helped across the street that they don't mind being slaves in exchange. And I say, we don't need this kind of women. So there's my solution. You'll give women equal rights in every possible respect the birth rate will go down, the population will be stabilized, humanity will survive so that women's lib is vital not only for women, but for men too. Of course, people, people say to me, how are you going to persuade all the different places on the earth to grant equal rights to women, even macho communities like south of the border? And old and all traditional places where women have for thousands of years been considered a domestic animal, somewhat higher than the ox perhaps, but definitely lower than the horse. And I feel, I feel that what's going to happen is as population goes up, it's going to be clear to governments all over the world that things are just going very bad and they'll have to do something, and I'm convinced that there'll be no way of handling the problem humanely except by giving women equality, forcing women to accept real, uh, equality. Of course, you know what human beings are like. They may prefer inhumane methods like forcible sterilization, like massacres, like all sorts of fun things like that there. And to people who are against birth control, I suppose this is preferable. At least I can't imagine why else they should be opposed to birth control. Well then, if we manage to control the population, what next? The difficulty is, of course, that there is supposed to be 60 billion barrels of oil in the 600 billion barrels of oil in the ground and we're consuming 30 billion barrels a year 20 billion barrels a year if you divide 600 billion by 20 billion and you keep the zero straight the answer is 30 which means that at the present rate of use we've got enough oil to last us 30 years and after that we're in trouble there's plenty of more energy but we're geared the earth is geared to the use of oil, which is by all odds the cheapest and most convenient energy source we've ever had. To develop other energy sources is going to mean a capital investment, and it's going to mean a lot of maintenance, and a lot of research, and a lot of trouble. So what we ought to do is start going through all this trouble, and all this expense, and all this effort, and all this emotional turmoil right now and conserve our fossil fuels as much as we can so as to give us as much lead time as possible. And this is going to be difficult. And the only thing in its, in its favor is that it may save civilization for those of you who think it's worth saving. For those of you who don't, you might recall that if you don't save it, we lose several billion lives the world over, of which your own may be one. And if you still don't think that's important, then you're fortunate. Nothing can happen to you that's important. 
Now, where are we going to get energy from? There's plenty of energy in the universe. There's plenty of available energy in the universe. It just means learning how to use it. And what we want, there are all kinds of energy, I won't bother listing them all because this is, you can't pick up a newspaper or a magazine without their discussing different energy sources. We'll take it as red. There are all kinds of energy sources and we can use them all because in some places on Earth and at some times and for some purposes, one particular energy source may be particularly convenient. Heck, there are many times when human muscle is the most convenient energy source, although this gets hard to believe. But try reproduction without the use of human muscles and you'll see what I mean. It doesn't work with windmills. <laughs> well, what we need though, backing up all this, is some form of energy which is copious, safe, and eternal. By copious, I mean there's enough of the energy to supply Earth's entire needs, even if all other sources of energy were discounted. By safe, obviously, I mean that there are no side effects resulting from the use of energy which can cause harm. And eternal means, well, it sounds like it means lasting forever. But supposing we limit it and say it lasts as long as, as humanity does. Uh, is it all right if it runs out when we run out as a species? Uh, okay then, let's take these one at, a, one at a time. What's copious? There are only two forms of energy that are really copious in the sense of always being copious. One is nuclear fusion. This is not to be confused with nuclear fission, which we have now. Nuclear fission is very useful. It works, we know it works. It keeps New England warm during the cold winters when Ohio freezes to death because one year it's natural gas, the next year it's coal. Meanwhile, New England has no problems it has nuclear plants which produce the electricity and it can ship electricity to other parts of the country. You don't like nuclear plants, I don't blame you, but you use the electricity it produces. It's one of those things you demonstrate against nuclear, nuclear plants, but you don't turn off the electric switches. So that I... <laughs> I beg leave to sniff a little hypocrisy here. But, uh, well, if you prefer to sniff that, you may. <laughs> Nuclear fusion, on the other hand, has an easier source. It's heavy hydrogen, not uranium. Heavy hydrogen can be gotten out of the oceans. Not only that, it delivers seven times as much energy, weight for weight, as nuclear fission does. It doesn't form nuclear wastes. It does, form tridi it does involve tritium and neutrons, which we hope will produce a far lesser problem than the radioactive ash that the fission plants do. And it is available everywhere, since water is practically a universal commodity, except in some deserts where very few people live anyway. There's only one catch with nuclear fusion, which, by the way, will last for billions of years. There's only one catch, and that is we haven't got it yet. And we don't know when we'll have it. I feel we'll have it before long, but we haven't got it yet. And when we do get it, it'll take perhaps 30 years before we can build a large nuclear fusion power plant and get all the bugs out of it. And there are some people who suspect that the bugs will be sufficiently complex so that we may not be able to make use of it after all. I hope that these pessimists are confounded, but we can only wait and see. Meanwhile, we can't afford to attempt nuclear fusion alone or entirely. We must go to the other source of energy, which is copious, can support us all, safe, produces relatively little in the way of injurious side effects, and eternal, will last as long as Humanity will, and that, of course, is the sun. And since this is Sunday, I say it with a proper reverence. If we can use sun power, I don't mean just in low-intensity situations as in warming houses. 
I mean by conversion into electricity, which is a high intensity energy sort of thing. That can be done with present techniques. We have photoelectric cells, we have solar batteries. We can expose wafers of silicon to the sunlight and build up an electromotive force and create an electric current. We have to, it's a low efficiency thing so far and quite expensive so far, and sunlight is very dilute. There's a lot of sunlight, but it's spread out so that we would have to coat thousands of square miles of desert area so as to get maximum sun. And even then, it wouldn't be working 12 hours out of every 24 on the average because you don't pick up much in the way of sunlight at night. <laughs> and there's so far no efficient way of storing electricity so that we can we can pick up a lot of electricity during the day and then use the stored electricity at night. You would have to have stations at opposite ends of the earth, different places that always be some in daylight. And of course, also, even the, the air does stop and absorb a certain amount of solar energy, no matter how clear it is. And any time it gets misty and foggy and cloudy, it loses a lot more. And you can't help but think how much more efficient it would be if we could build the solar power collecting stations in space, put them up over the equatorial plane at a height of 22,000 plus miles, and have it revolve around the Earth in 24 hours, a synchronous revolution about the Earth, so that it'll always stay more or less over one spot on Earth. It would absorb sunlight, a full range of solar energy, never in any way stopped, depleted, absorbed by anything at all, hardly ever be in the Earth's night shadow. Under ordinary conditions, it would miss the thinned shadow, the tapering sh night beam uh, at a height of 22,000 plus miles, and would only pass through at a certain period of time before and after the equinoxes, and over the space of a year, it would spend only 2% of its time in the shadow. And of course, you would have a number of them all around the Earth, and they could supply the whole Earth with energy, beaming them down in the form of microwaves to be absorbed on Earth with much greater efficiency than undiluted sunlight is. Of course, we know that microwaves can be dangerous. We're not going to beam them down in the middle of Amherst, <laughs> even though some of you may think it's a good idea. <laughs> and there is every reason to think that we can arrange it so if anything goes wrong, the beam is instantly dispersed, becomes only minimally dangerous, and is stopped. Naturally, you wouldn't want to move through the beam, but presumably airplanes will know how to avoid it, and even if they do go through it, they will remain through it so, small, so, so short a time that the danger is minimal. Birds flying through it, if they decide to pause on the wing while in it and fly round and round and round, may eventually come out broiled. <laughs> but I have every reason to think that birds won't do it even if you beg them to? <laughs> it may work. There's the danger of thermal pollution, that is, that is heat is added to the Earth, which it wouldn't otherwise get, so that the average temperature of the Earth would go up. And you would, that would limit the amount of energy you could receive from such solar stations, uh, because if you raise the temperature of the Earth sufficiently, why, well, you'll melt the ice caps and raise the water level of the oceans 200 feet and drown all the coastal plains of the world, which are precisely the most populated regions. Well, we wouldn't, we, this, would, this doesn't mean we can't use any amount of heat, just not too much. It still leaves us a liberal supply until such time as we learn how to help the Earth radiate the excess heat. Well now, what else is good about this thing which is generally considered uh, a kind of feat of fantasy? Hard-headed people are against such solar power stations for a variety of reasons. They say, you realize how expensive it is? Sure, sure I realize how expensive it is. It's likely to take 100 billion 
dollars a year, say over a space of 20, uh, I'm sorry, 100 billion dollars over the space of 20, 20 years, which is say 5 billion dollars a year. Who's going to spend 5 billion dollars a year? It's a lot of money. It's more than tuition. <laughs> right now. But the people who are worried about five billion a year don't realize that we spend a lot more than that on booze and a lot more than that on smokes. And no one has ever said that the space program does any more harm than waste money. There are rumors that tobacco and alcohol do actual harm beyond the waste of money, actual physical harm. Of course, they also bring pleasure. And people say, this is cheap of you, Asimov, since you don't smoke and don't drink, to cast aspersions upon other people's pleasures and imply that they should easily sacrifice them for something you are interested in. And I recognize the justice of this, and I sniff a certain amount of hypocrisy in myself when I talk this way. But then, supposing we consider war and preparations for war, now, who gets personal pleasure out of war? Who really considers it a fun activity these days? <laughs> Nobody is going to admit in public he wants war, he enjoys it because the excitement makes his blood race through his veins and just gives him that good old tingly feeling. <laughs> Everyone gets up and says, I hate war, but we have to be prepared as a deterrent, right? so that the world now spends $400 billion every year to support its various war machines, its various competing war machines. $400 billion every year. I used to say $300 billion. Now it's gone to $400 billion. By the year 2000, the present rate of increase will be $1 trillion a year, if we get there, which I doubt. Well, for goodness sakes, what is the $400 billion a year buying us? What good are the war machines? We can't use them. We can't have a thermonuclear war at all because it's universal destruction. As a matter of fact, it doesn't supply, a thermonuclear war doesn't supply us with the minimum virtue of a war, which is one of the reasons I don't think it'll be fought. You see, the thing with a thermonuclear war is we have every reason to think it'll last maybe a day and a half. And in a day and a half, there's no time for promotions to come through for the generals. It's worse than that. You can't even have regular wars. You can't even have the kind of wars we once had in the good old days. <laughs> the fun wars, like World War II. I mean, you can imagine the Soviet Union and the United States getting together and deciding the generals are rusty and they need a war, but come on, fellas, on a bright, we won't use nuclear weapons, we won't use jet planes, we're gonna build us a lot of World War II artillery and planes and tanks, and we'll fight it like gentlemen. So, so they'll draw a line down the middle of a neutral nation, and they'll line up on... <laughs> you guys are so naive. That's what neutral nations are for, for goodness <laughs> sake. And you'll line up on either side, and for four or five years, maybe six if it's too exciting to stop, you have frontal penetrations and flank attacks and artillery bombardments and bombing attacks and, and maybe if you want some sort of old-fashioned excitement, poison gas, things like that. <laughs> at the end of the time, at the end of the time, you, should you see who's where, who has accomplished what, how many people have been killed, and you assign indemnities and on exchanges of territory and all that. The losing side shoots its generals. Now that's... <laughs> That's the great problem. I've always maintained that if the losing side in any war automatically shot his generals, and if the generals were told this in advance, there'd never be any wars, because the generals would always say they weren't ready. But uh, you don't do it. It's just considered not sporting. But why can't we fight a war like that? Easy. We don't have the gasoline for it anymore. You know how much gasoline it takes to run even a World War II war nowadays? 
more than we can afford to spend considering we've only got a 30-year supply left. And don't tell me we're going to find more gasoline supp uh, petroleum supplies. No matter how much we find, it may extend it another 10 years, no more. Heck, you can't even fight little wars anymore. I mean, supposing you have a war between two small nations that don't have nuclear weapons. They're forced to fight it with non-nuclear weapons. Naturally, neither one is going to fight it unless they can get the weapons from one of the great powers so that they can have really sophisticated non-nuclear weapons. Otherwise, there's no fun in fighting the war. Well, that means one side calls in the Soviet Union, the other side calls in the United States. Now they fight the war. It can only last six days. <laughs> After six days, one side may be winning, whereupon the other side has to be helped by its nation even more because they don't want to lose face, which means the other nation has to help its side, and before you know it, you've got a thermonuclear war. So if there's any danger of one side winning, and usually that's... that's pretty determinable after six days, Is any, they, they stop it. Happens all the time. The other kind of a war is when you have a small war where the great powers aren't interested. This hardly happens anymore. In which case, they fight with slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. <laughs> and it takes them 17 years to kill 100 people. And nobody cares. Or you can have terrorism. You can always have terrorism, because all it takes is five men or women. You call yourself the Cosmic International Army of Human Righteousness. <laughs> and when no one's looking, you shoot people in the back. <laughs> and you proudly proclaim it in secret messages when no one is looking. And say how brave you are. Uh, well, you get the headlines, you get pictures in the paper. If you happen to be caught and imprisoned, your comrades kill somebody else to get them to release you. And it's more fun than you can shake a barrel of, a barrel of monkeys at. The only thing is it never accomplishes anything. It just never does. In the whole history of mankind, terrorism has never accomplished anything except when it's backed by an official army. And these days, we can't have an official army backing it because the whole thing is we can't fight a war. So it's just terrorism all by itself. You get nothing out of it except newspaper headlines, television coverage, a little pain and discomfort to individual people. And if you're not directly involved, you can endure it philosophically. And therefore, what the heck is the whole use of this entire military machine? You say it's a deterrent just to make sure there's no war. Fine. Except that just keeping a military machine in being is extremely expensive and, w and wastes a huge amount of energy and accomplishes nothing but destruction. We're going to be destroyed by military machines even if we don't use them. And yet we spend $400 billion a year as a quick road to suicide. And we don't feel we're wasting the money. For one thing, we're going to get our money's worth. We want suicide, we'll get suicide. No question of being cheated. But if someone were to suggest spend $5 billion a year for a sure source of energy, which will be serviceable for the entire world, you holler expense, expense. It's $400 million a year for destruction, not one penny for salvation. This is the new cry of all the hard-headed critics. And the only reason they're hard-headed is because solid bone from ear to ear. <laughs> now let's suppose we have these solar power stations. We're building them, we found the money. Well, heck, where are we going to get the material from? You know, Earth is running low on all sorts of resources. How are we going to build a hundred power stations up there along with all the spaceships it takes and all the fuel it takes and so on? Well, for one thing, as far as material is concerned, we've got a beautiful piece of real estate up there in the moon. The moon is 181st, the mass of the entire Earth, and it's only there, 237,000 miles away. You say, listen, that's a long distance. No, it isn't. It's three days away. It's three days away. We have sent so far 
let's see now, 15 people to the moon, 12 made it, 3 didn't, but every single one of them got back. You can't get safety records like that almost anywhere. And that, even though they rode, rode on ships, which were the best you could build with the lowest bidders. And <laughs> now Columbus, he did something. That was difficult. I don't want to run down the astronauts. Believe me, you couldn't, get me on a, you couldn't even get me on an airplane. But nevertheless, the fact remains, if I had my choice, I'd rather go with Neil Armstrong than with Christopher Columbus. Columbus had three ships that were salvaged, that were salvaged on the point of sinking. A any storm would have sunk him. Any storm. In fact, coming back, a storm did sink the Santa Maria. But going there, he hit the only seven-week stretch in the history of the North Atlantic without a storm. <laughs> What's more, he didn't know where he was going. He thought he was going to Asia. He didn't make it, frankly. And as, and as for the crew, they didn't know any, with anything about where they were going. There was nothing with the heck. You go to the moon, you've got it easy. You drive to the top of the atmosphere, look around, there's the moon. <laughs> You aim at it. <laughs> and furthermore, if you're going to the moon, you knew for sure that there weren't going to be any hostile natives there. <laughs> so on the whole, going to the moon is easy. In terms of our technology today, it's much easier than Columbus's trip to America. So we go there and we set it up as a mining station. We can get everything from the moon that we need except carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and that Earth will supply for a while. Of course, lots of people are horrified. They say, gee, we've been, we've been mucking up the Earth, now we're going to go there and muck up the moon, too. And my answer is, why not? The moon doesn't belong to anybody. <laughs> there is no life on the moon of any kind. There aren't even any germs to give you concern over, you know, bacterial rights. Uh, <laughs> now, there are two things that concern us on Earth. One is that the moon looks pretty, and you don't want it sort of, you don't want it moth-eaten. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, providence in its infinite wisdom has decreed that the moon present one face only to the earth at all times. You know, I have a feeling I've been neglecting you people. <laughs> and this means that we can work on the other side where no one standing on earth will ever see the moth-eatenness. The other fact is that the moon, thanks to its mass, does create the tides. And if we reduce the mass, we reduce the tides. And we might not like this, but I assure you that all our fooling around on the surface of the moon and digging up ore, etc., is going to take thousands of years before we make the slightest perceptible diminution of its mass. So I think we can use the moon fine. And of course, it's not going to be useful to commute to outer space and to the moon in order to build the space power stations. Very expensive to send people up at 8 a.m. and bring them down at 5 p.m., you know? <laughs> what you really need are space colonies, space settlements. You'll have people living in space settlements and they'll be doing the work. Of course, it'll be interesting that as they do the work, other space settlements, other power stations. They'll be quickly returning profits on the initial investment. Not only will the expense be far less than that which is produced by the, by the competing military establishments, but whereas the competing military establishments never return a profit, these space activities will in the form of energy eventually. And in the space of a few decades, we'll be getting far more back in the way of energy than we ever spent building them. In fact, we can build all kinds of things in space. One thing, one advantage space has is there's lots of room there. 
We can transfer observatories into space. We can transfer laboratories into space. We can transfer industries into space where they can take advantage of hard vacuum, of high and low temperatures, of hard radiation, of gravity-free conditions, all sorts of things will make it possible for them to produce all kinds of industrial, cybernetic, uh, et cetera, et cetera, gym cracks, tools, devices, that either can't be, perform, uh, can't be formed on Earth at all or only with the greatest difficulty. In fact, space may be the Japan of the 21st century. <laughs> Furthermore, if we get, if we get as, many, uh, as much of our industrial establishment into space as possible, why? We'll get rid of the side effects of industry. Lots of people who don't like what the Industrial Revolution has done to man. They make use of all its advantages, but they don't like its disadvantages. And they would like to see, get rid of our industrial society, provided they can think of some way of doing it without losing their firm grip on the advantages. You know, it's these people who denounce the automobile and strum away on their electric guitars, anti-automobile songs. So. <laughs> I say if you get industry into space, you are in a sense getting rid of at least some of the disadvantages of our industrial civilization and saving its advantages. They're not far away, only a few thousand miles, but all their waste matter, all their pollution, all their noise, all their whatever you don't want is up there. You don't even have to send many people up there because undoubtedly if civilization continues, they'll be automated and computerized to a fairly well. And with everything up in space, none of it actually belongs to any particular spot on Earth. It would pay everybody on Earth to contribute all they can, even if a small nation can only contribute paper clips, let them contribute all they can to the establishment of the space economy. And it would encourage international cooperation to the point where it would be the equivalent of a world government. World government has a bad press. Nobody wants a world government. But I say we need a world government, and I admit it might be a good idea not, not to call it a world government. I figure you can call it anything you want. You can call it anarchism if you want. You can call it freedom and liberty if you want. You can call it a genuine cooperative spirit amongst Earth's proud population, if you want, just so long as it's really a world government. It's necessary, you can't help it, as long as the world is divided up into 150 separate regions, each one of which thinks, each one of which thinks it's God, and that its national security comes first and everything else second, we're all going to die. So we've got to get away with it. I don't like having a world government. I don't like any government. They all charge me taxes. I hate it. <laughs> but there's no way out. You've got to. You, the, look, I get letters from people saying yours for less government. What they really mean is yours for less centralized government. If Washington abdicates and there's less government at the center, it means that the local bully boy on the block is the government. And I would rather have it in Washington. The local bully boy knows where to find me. <laughs> so there's the future I foresee as a possible one. Energy from space, space fully exploited, a nice computerized automated civilization, women's lib also, which I haven't discussed in this particular speech, but for very good reasons, revolutions in education, an automatic end to racism because the earth cannot, con cannot continue under an appropriate civilization as long as some people feel rightly that they are discriminated against. And this is going to be a sort of peaceful world, a sort of world as I see it, which has accomplished its aims, and they're liable to be bored to death. I mean, having saved them from all the different kinds of deaths through overpopulation, through energy starvation, through pollution, through internal violence and terrorism, through all this, you end up with everyone just yawning themselves to death. Because after all, through all of history, through all of history, 
Men have been used, human beings have been used to living with risk and danger, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they'll still exist up there. And in the end, find new place where for a period of time population can expand, where you can be a pioneer, where you can take your risks. It may be that the space settlers will be the cutting edge of human exploration, that it is they who will explore the outer solar system, it is they who will build and take part in these great starships that may someday leave the solar system forever on their slow way towards distant stars. It is through them that we may fall heir to the universe. It is through them that we will finally outgrow the infancy of the human race, stuck as it is to the cradle of the earth, and through them we will finally become adults and expand and spread out into our proper home, which is nothing less than, than the entire universe. And if out there we find other creatures intelligent enough to be expanding on their own, then I suggest we will by that time discover that there is such a thing as a siblinghood of intelligence. Any intelligent species that has reached the point where it can expand beyond its own planetary system must have defeated those, or maybe never had them, those vile instincts which led them to fight with each other. Because if we can't defeat them, we'll never get out into space. We'll all die right here on Earth. If we get out into space, it's because we have learned how to do something better than to destroy our brother and sister. And if we do, they do too. And when we meet, it will be on an entirely new basis of humanity in a general sense, not referring to the human species alone. After all, the vast evolution of the universe from the very beginning of its existence as a cosmic egg or as a thin scattering of dust and gas has been to increase the complexity of its parts until some of it has grown sufficiently complex to have a brain sufficiently elevated to be able to look at the universe and wonder what it is and what it's like and how best to cooperate with it to expand. It is different parts of the universe becoming aware of itself. And it doesn't matter what the outward shape of the self-awareness is, only its function that of self-awareness. And when we can join the brotherhood of intelligence at last, we will know that the human species is finally adult. Thank you very much.